So the next ses session is on monitoring and surveillance. There are a lot of legal questions around privacy when we start monitoring people's activities. And when the person we're monitoring may not have the mental capacity to give consent to the monitoring, we run into gray areas. And also when the people providing the caregiver, caregiving services may not be comfortable being monitored themselves around the care they're giving to the older adult, it gets even more complicated. And then you have the liability where somebody with dementia may wander off. And last year, a lady died in North Vancouver at the, in the forest. Um, what is the liability? What's reasonably to be expected of a caregiver? So Al Gina is going to talk about the situation for paid caregivers in residential care homes, for example. And Wendy's going to talk about the situation for family caregivers, where the older adult is still living in their home. And then Michael Vaughn is with BC Civil Liberties and is going to talk about the legal questions around privacy. Um, and as they'll all tell you, this is a fast evolving and still uncertain area of activity. So Al Gina. And as, as we were told yesterday, if you want to read more about these people, their resumes are in the handout package you got. We weren't to spend time talking about it here. And if we can hold all the questions till the end, is there three panel members that might go better? And there will be lots of time for questions at the end. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Surveillance and monitoring residential care. Very, very um, uh, interesting area, especially um, in, in residential care. Uh, I just wanted to introduce myself. Um, I am Al uh, Gina. I am, I am a lawyer by profession, uh, and, uh, but my wife is a nurse, and she got me into, this, into the long-term care business, business, and initially I was fairly naive in terms of how operations go, but I realized this is a very, very sort of complex area, and there are a lot of, lot of issues uh, around that. And I'm going to take you through some of the issues that we encounter at some of our homes, how we deal with them. Uh, and also some of the parameters uh, when it comes to ethics law uh, around uh, surveillance and monitoring. Uh, so the presentation will examine uh, the, uh, this, uh, the use of surveillance from, from uh, these perspectives. What are the ethical implications? What are the legal regulatory implications? Uh, when and where uh, should this technology uh, be utilized in residential care facilities? Um, and, and, and homes. Uh, the reasons for uh, surveillance in residential care are fairly um, apparent. You know, uh, you want to optimize the use of available staff on the floor. Um, you do want to have some uh, form of digital monitoring uh, of spaces beyond the visual range, um, you know, such as your building exits, entrances. Uh, you do want to ensure the standards of care are maintained uh, to meet company policies. Uh, licensing core requirements, and you also you want to provide an accurate record of interactions between your vulnerable uh, population residing within your facility uh, and uh, staff and with each other uh, as well too. But there are of course uh, many issues that have to be considered. So what are the ethics uh, governing surveillance and monitoring? Uh, what is the governing legislation uh, in BC, um, including uh, the BC uh, residents Bill of Rights for Seniors and Residential Care. And just this year, you know, I uh, did a, um, uh, you know, a, a, a webinar with um, the Canadian Bar Association uh, with 100 lawyers, and they had even more questions for me as well, too. So it just shows how vast the scope is of, uh, of the questions in, the, in this area. Uh, the Criminal Code of Canada has some prohibitions that we, should, we, we will consider, uh, and some case law as well, too, especially, you know, the case that uh, Martha Jane Lewis just mentioned uh, in North Vancouver involving a resident. Uh, U.S. legislation, what are the trends in the United States, uh, and some reasons for and against uh, electronic surveillance um, and monitoring. Uh, so the ethical issues, you know, there are, there are a large number of stakeholders in a residential care facility. It's a home, uh, you have residents, you have your professional staff uh, who have to meet 
um, the requires the Health Professions Act. Uh, you have housekeeping, you have caregiving, you have dietary staff, you have your, your, the administration, you have families, friends visiting, um, you have visitors and volunteers, you have uh, the unions and collective agreements uh, to, to uh, manage as well too. Uh, there are regulatory agencies, uh, licensing, health authorities, uh, as well as uh, your provincial funding uh, authorities as well too. So what is uh, uh, ethical uh, for residents? And all, um, all images used in my presentation are uh, real Park Place residents, and um, in keeping with, with this presentation, they have provided their consent. Uh, and, uh, you know, they, they, they all are happy to be acting, and some of them say, you know, please tell, our, tell your audience uh, hi from us as well, too. So they're quite, quite excited um, to, to be part of this presentation. So, um, uh, you know, improved, I mean, the, 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 it's, it's justi justifiable. I mean, the, the, the objectives are improved quality of life, uh, improved quality of care, uh, you know, freedom from uh, abuse or neglect, but also you also have to preserve uh, your personal privacy uh, and uh, preserve confidentiality as well too. Uh, for your uh, professional staff, your nurses, your doctors, you know, um, you know, I mean, it's justifiable if you have reliable, valid uh, data to guide assessment, uh, improve treatment, uh, protection from malpractice, uh, or wrongful allegations. Uh, yet you do want to maintain confidentiality of medical records and personal privacy uh, for residents, uh, staff, uh, and consultants. Uh, for your staff, I mean, you know, clearly, you know, they, they want protection from uh, wrongful allegations. Um, you know, it's a tool for improved monitoring and residents for, for the safety. Uh, they do want uh, proof of uh, some provision of, the, uh, of, of, the, of quality of care. Uh, and, but also some, also privacy as well too. They don't want uh, to work under the um, a gaze of a camera all the time. Uh, for your management, um, you know, it's just ethically justifiable if it's a means to maximize quality of life and quality of care of your residents. Um, it's, it is a, a fiscally responsible way of monitoring the facility, you know, and, and include, especially on the uh, entrances uh, and exits, you know, uh, some of our facilities are located in low-income neighborhoods where you can have some challenges, um, and, and, and uh, you know, uh, monitoring is necessary around the entrances and exits, uh, and reduce le legal risks for the care home. Uh, for families and friends, you know, clearly, I mean, the families and, and residents, I mean, they want to maximize the quality of life and quality of care for their loved ones. Um, uh, but yet they still want to maintain privacy uh, for residents, families, uh, and friends. And for your visitors and volunteers, you know, um, I mean, clearly, you know, for those who are visiting, you want some improved security, you want protection from wrongful allegations, but yet you want to maintain uh, privacy uh, for the visitors and volunteers as well, too. Now, collective agreements, um, you know, uh, you want improved workplace security for staff. I mean, if there's through, through surveillance, sometimes you can find out if um, there's uh, any um, uh, risk or any security risks um, that are taking place, or if any there's any psychogeriatric residents who are who may who may may be a risk to staff. But I, but it also you know uh, you want to minimize a risk of malpractice uh, or wrongful accusation, but yet you also want uh, privacy. I mean, they should be able to uh, you know provide. Um, care and a lot of care is fairly intimate uh, within within a private um, setting. Uh, for your regulatory agencies, and there are a lot in uh, in BC. You have licensing. You have um, the uh, patient quality care uh, agency as well too, a board. Um, and if those are not satisfactory to, to a family or complainant, they can then, of course, go to the senior's advocate. They can go to the ombudsperson uh, as well, too. They can even go to the, to the um, uh, health authority itself uh, as well, too. So for them, uh, what they want is uh, reliable, valid quality of life and quality of care data uh, to support your licensing uh, and recertification contract renewals uh, on an ongoing, ongoing basis. Uh, it's a means, quite often, of quickly and accurately investigating complaints uh, or allegations of wrongdoing, yet it maintains the privacy for residents and staff. So sometimes when an incident does occur 
and an investigation happens, especially you know, in a dementia care unit. It's, it, it, it gets to be he said, she said, and sometimes you know, your, your video surveillance um, film can provide uh, more reliable uh, data. Um, and in terms of regulatory authorities, um, the, 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 the six ladies, uh, you, the, the six people you see over there are, are surveyors from Accreditation Canada. Uh, they are very uh, senior uh, nursing administrators uh, from uh, provinces, uh, Quebec, Ontario, Alberta, uh, who in 2014 came and surveyed all Park Place um, uh, long-term care, residential care facilities uh, to ensure that we met um, standards. And the quality dimension standards that had to be met were 384 uh, standards, everything related, regarding nursing charts, regarding ac your activity plans, your dietary menus, uh, and what you're doing for staff as well, too. Uh, for your funding authorities, uh, what is ethically justifiable is that the proof, uh, there's proof that care meets quality of life, quality of care standards, um, some information on the level of care, uh, but yet, of course, you know, privacy for residents and staff. Now, what, what is the legal regulatory uh, sort of framework um, in BC uh, that applies to uh, surveillance in uh, residential care facilities? And the province of BC has developed a substantial body of legislation uh, to govern uh, privacy uh, in care homes. Uh, so you have the Community Care and Assisted Living Act uh, of 2002, and Section 7 is the key operating provision uh, of that legislation. And it says that you know uh, a licensee must uh, operate the, uh, the facility in a manner that uh, will promote health, safety, and dignity, uh, and also the rights of those persons uh, in care. Um, the Act also provides that uh, anyone licensed to operate a community care facility must display the rights of adult persons in care in a prominent place uh, in the facility uh, and in a formal manner acceptable to the minister. And uh, to make the rights of that person in care known orally and in writing to persons in care and their families and representatives. Uh, now BC a few years ago did pass uh, a residence uh, bill of rights. Uh, and under this Bill of Rights, which is under Schedule 7 of the Continuing Care um, and Assisted Living Act, um, you know, an adult person uh, has the right uh, to be uh, to the protection and safety and dignity as well, too, um, including the right to all of the following: to have his or her personal privacy respected, um, including in relation to his or her records, bedroom, belongings, and storage spaces and to receive visitors and to communicate with visitors uh, in private. So, and, and your, your, your use of video surveillance cannot uh, contravene uh, this section of the uh, BC Residence Bill of Rights. There is also similar, uh, similar uh, a patient Bill of Rights uh, in the Hospital Act. And uh, in BC, you have two key governing legislation uh, for residential care facilities. You have the Continuing Care and Assisted Living Act that governs most homes, but a third of the, the beds are uh, governed under the Hospital Act Part 2, and most of them are usually extended care facilities that are attached to hospitals uh, or old, uh, older, older uh, private hospitals as well, too. And for, for you know, under that uh, 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 legislation, uh, what, what we have is the Patient Bill of Rights. Uh, that applies. Uh, the uh, BC residential care regulations is quite extensive and the applicable section there is section 53. Um, the, the, you know, um, the licensee must ensure uh, respect for the personal privacy of each person in care, including the privacy of each person in care's bedroom, belongings, uh, and storage area as well too. Now there are also uh, a whole host of other um, uh, legislation as well too that uh, applies um, in our sector as well too. So we have the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act, what, what is sort of abbreviated and known as FOIPA uh, in our sector. And that re relates to the uh, records, charts uh, primarily, of all residents who are in government-funded residential care beds. 
Uh, and then you also have the Personal Information and Protection Act, and that relates to all uh, nursing charts and personal information uh, of residents in private pay uh, residential care facilities. Uh, and then we have the Ombudsperson Act, the Patient Care Quality Review Board Act, as well as Seniors Advocate Act. And all of these have, they have powers of investigation, uh, uh, you know, to follow up on any complaints that are launched. Um, and and, and, and the, the powers are quite wide, quite wide as well too. Uh, the Ombudsperson Act, as many of you are familiar, did have, did carry out a, a very wide ranging review of seniors care in BC, you know, a few years ago and issued a three volume report um, that's quite extensive uh, with I think over 200 uh, recommendations um, in that report as well too. Uh, the Seniors Advocate Act is very new, fairly new. It was just passed in 2013. Uh, we are still waiting for uh, the regulations to be enacted under this uh, legislation. Uh, but the Seniors Advocate is mostly looking at systemic issues, uh, large issues that affect our sector. And surveillance, you know, one can say systemic, so it's a new and emerging area that affects many. Uh, and that is, that is one that the seniors advocate uh, may, may take, a, take a look at if she thinks it's, it warrants her attention. Okay, thank you. Under federal law, Criminal uh, Code of Canada, there's uh, legislation that governs uh, voyeurism. Uh, you know, there is, there is a defense, uh, you know, uh, if, if, as long as you're serving the public good, uh, you know, uh, then, then that section does not apply. Uh, and also, you know, you cannot intercept private communication or the phone. Uh, and again, there's, there's a defense as well too, as long as it's uh, consent by one of the parties, uh, then that, that, is, that is fine as well too. So to go over um, and pass the Criminal Code of Canada, uh, you know, usually most people acknowledge this video surveillance at the site so that it removes uh, the expectation of privacy um, uh, to occur, so, and, and, and that is one, one thing that facilities do. Um, in uh, 2011, uh, there was a very well publicized coroner's investigation uh, which used video footage from a North Vancouver care home. Uh, it was fortunately not a, not a Park Place home. Uh, and um, a, a resident had died. The care home had reported that the resident had not shown signs of distress uh, and had uh, died after breakfast while alone in his room. A family member contacted the BC Coroner Service with a conflicting report uh, that the resident had died after choking on food while being fed breakfast by a staff member. Uh, the family had surreptitiously set up a nanny cam in the room and had a video of the incident, which was then sort of turned over uh, to the coroner. Um, the coroner, uh, coroner's report uh, it was, it was quite extensive and concluded that you know, uh, the resident was a challenging patient to care for, staff was ill-prepared and incapable of dealing with his issues, issues known to exist in the elderly and vulnerable population uh, in such facilities. If not for the video brought forward by the family, uh, the resident's accidental death uh, would not have surfaced. Uh, the coroner's report does not really look at the ethics of the video uh, placement in the room, but um, that was uh, that's a key uh, report in BC. Who's watching? I mean, there's spyware uh, everywhere. And in the United States, some states have passed uh, legislation to allow video surveillance uh, in nursing homes. Uh, Texas was the first state uh, to pass uh, such legislation. Uh, they expressly permitted inst installation of surveillance camera, uh, but prior to the installation of cameras, express written consent is required from the resident or the resident's guardian. The notice of surveillance must be posted both at the entrance to the care home as well as at the entrance to the resident's room. Uh, and since Texas passed that legislation, there have now been at least uh, uh, several other states who have passed legislation, um, similar legislation. So Maryland, New Mexico, Washington, and Oklahoma as well too. But some states have rejected uh, passing such legislation as well too. So it's a, it's a hot debate. Uh, so surveillance, you know, um, pro and against in residential care homes, you know, if you have the, the, the reasons for surveillance, you know, if the suspicion, families are concerned uh, that they're not receiving updates about their loved ones, concerns about understaffing, there's a history of violations, there's a belief that surveillance will result in more attentive care. On the other hand, you know, you do have to have uh, privacy issues and respect and dignity issues as well too. Uh, you know, you're filming 
uh, the residents the most intimate moments, bathing, toileting, uh, clothing, transferring, feeding, etc. And when I talk to our directors of care, what do you think? I mean, today, on a practical basis, at Park Place facilities, most of our staff, uh, we carry on our duties knowing that we may be filmed at any time. They are, they always expect that they may be on camera. Uh, but of course, you know, the reality is that we, you know, if you talk to an experienced director of care, they will say that it's fairly creepy to have somebody watch mom receive peri care. You know, that's, that's their, 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 their sense of it. Um, and, this, and, and sometimes it's all a negative, negative reaction by caregivers as well too. There are alternatives to surveillance, you know, build trust, um, improve engagement with residents, families, uh, friends from the outset will establish strong partnership, um, have an open door uh, with visits, uh, you have your best practices, resident-centered care, uh, and Accreditation Canada, you know, include, you have your teams, include your families in your teams uh, as well too when you are reviewing, uh, uh, you know, meeting all the quality standards, uh, and, that is the, and that is key as well too. Um, as part of Accreditation Canada, for example, Park Place, we had um, uh, a survey of 900 of our staff filled out uh, employee surveys about how they feel about working at, at, at our facilities. Okay. Um, uh, you know, uh, again, the um, you know, video chats are very helpful, um, utilizing software and private uh, password protected online logs uh, to share daily reports are also very helpful as well, especially around events like pub nights and uh, bowling, etc. Care homes, um, you know, uh, may be uh, tempted uh, to install surveillance, uh, but there's also, you know, uh, privacy also has to be uh, uh, strongly regarded as well too uh, in this decision as well too. Looking at your upgrading your homes, in, improving staff li sight lines, uh, looking at schedules, uh, you know, uh, really helps as well too. And planning with your care teams on what it is. Uh, one of the uh, one of the item of, about care surveillance and monitoring that I do want to discuss is is bed alarms, bed and chair alarms. Uh, they have become quite you, you, you are quite uh, uh, you see them quite often now in in uh, residential care facilities when they are, they are sensor pads and when a resident gets out of bed or gets off a chair, the alarm goes off, right? And um, the alarms of some, some of the portable alarms are very loud and very disturbing for residents. Um, so if an alarm is used, you know, we need to sort of switch to a system that sends an alert directly to a care aid's pager uh, as opposed to setting the alarm off in the room. It's, it's very loud and it's actually quite, it, it, you know, it's, it's, it's quite constraining uh, to a resident as well too. Uh, we had a discussion yesterday about hip protectors, uh, you know, floor mats uh, to minimize injury as well too would be helpful. Um, at two of our sites, um, uh, Spring Valley in Kelowna, we were able to reduce bed alarms to 10% of residents. Uh, at our facility in Calgary, um, the administrator there took a lead and was very um, opposed to bed alarms. Um, and you know, it, it was getting to be a real nuisance and has taken, and has taken a lead and has we've been able to manage uh, reducing the use of bed alarms by looking at our uh, restructuring our staffing in our care neighborhoods as well too. Uh, the other thing that uh, is used to monitoring is your wrist and ankle bracelets. Um, they sound alarm if, if, if the resident tries to leave the unit. Uh, Park Place does not use them, um, and we have not used them for over 20 years. We just feel that it is very uh, dignified. There are better ways uh, of, of uh, monitoring your residents. Uh, the residents hate them. They will cut, take scissors and cut them off the wrist, uh, or they'll try to yank them and just injure themselves. And the ankle bracelets as well, too, lugging that around, is they, they, just, they, they, just, they just hate it. So we have done away with it altogether. Uh, GPS lo locators uh, have, you know, we have we've sort of had these, some uh, experimentation, but it's not uh, popular in residential care uh, at all. It's not used at all as well, too. So Park Place, you know, we um, operate in uh, uh, BC um, and Alberta as well, too, and uh, we have spoken to this uh, uh, what do you use if issue. you don't use the ankle or wrist ones? What do you replace that with? Um, if you, it, yeah, what, what you do is, uh, you know, if you have a neighborhood, we will have keypads on the door. That the the neighborhood is their safe space. They can um, they can walk around and wander around that neighborhood as they wish. Um, in a dementia unit, when families come in, we will tell them ahead of time that you know. Um, mom and dad, uh, this is a dementia unit, you know, residents will wander into your loved one's room and they will be walk walking and they will check the closets out 
or the drawers out. Uh, they are, you know, and, and similarly, your mom may walk into other residents' rooms as well. So you have to be respectful of that. Don't get upset if you see another resident in your mom's room fishing through the, the, the you know, the closets or the laundry. Uh, you know, you, you, you educate around that. You do leave um, handbags with scarves, you know, around, and they love fishing through that. So th these are some of the, some of the tools that, that, that we do use. Still morning, right? Is that right? Seems like it's been an early morning. Uh, thank you. Welcome. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's been a while since I've attended a freezing conference. Uh, I was in that second cohort of doing my master's degree in gerontology, and that seems like a long time ago. So uh, I'm a gerontologist by trade, and uh, I'm currently providing some consulting services to the family caregivers of British Columbia. That's their soft launch. You'll see that it says Family Caregivers Network Society. They've now changed their name uh, as of, I think, yesterday. So there wasn't quite enough time uh, uh, to change the logo. Uh, my other hat that I wear is uh, I actually do a lot of work with families and seniors uh, on Vancouver Island. And I do a lot of uh, work around providing uh, advice and referrals, uh, private geriatric case management uh, to help people understand their options as they age to support family caregivers uh, in uh, supporting the individuals that they're caring for. Uh, to look at how the private and public sectors meet and uh, how to make informed choices about remaining independent uh, for as long as possible. And uh, I have to admit, I, I didn't have a lot of uh, a knowledge around technology and aging, and so this conference has been, uh, has been amazing to attend. So before I begin, I just want to share a, a story around surveillance and monitoring. Uh, it actually involves myself. So about uh, four months ago, I ruptured my Achilles, I don't recommend that. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I, had, I had surgical repair, I was in a cast, and uh, at the time I was, uh, of the surgery, I was, I was living alone uh, in, in my home. And uh, when I came out of the surgery, it's a very quick surgery, um, the nurse was very adamant, you know, about, about me following protocol and taking my medications properly, and when you get home, make sure you take two of these morphines, and, and as an obedient patient, I did. And uh, I got home, it was probably around three o'clock in the afternoon. I took my morphine. I've never taken morphine before, that, uh, so you can only imagine what happened. So about, uh, about midnight, I wake up, I'm disorientated. I'm clearly cognitively impaired from the morphine. And um, I had forgotten about my Achilles. And so I attempt to walk to the bathroom. So we know that I fall and there's nobody living with me. And I, the first thing I think is, where is my PERS? Where's my personal emergency response system? <laughs> and I click a button. Uh, of course I couldn't, I had to drag myself across the floor uh, to reach my cell phone to call my trusty neighbor to come over and, uh, and A, help me locate my crutches because I couldn't go back and find those and uh, just to make sure that I was fine. So I was thinking to myself, uh, here I am at 42, I could have used some surveillance and monitoring uh, post, uh, post injury, but a little insight into uh, perhaps some of my own challenges uh, 40 years down the road and how far ahead we're going to be. So uh, what I'm gonna talk about today, uh, it's just important to know that I'm, I'm not a lawyer, I have no, no legal background whatsoever, um, but I do do a lot of work with family caregivers and, uh, and seniors, and so my perspective is going to be more from a consumer perspective, um, taking a look at some of the, the current technology uh, and, and who, who might benefit from that, what are some of the pros, what are some of the cons, um, to look at a, a case scenario. And then uh, I had a chance to call a couple of companies that offered uh, this, uh, you know, various levels of, of um, surveillance and monitoring and, and got some ideas about what that entailed and asked them some questions about, um, you know, how they deal with individuals who are a bit resistant or what type of information do they collect from individuals, how it's stored. Uh, so I'll share some of that with you. So this is Mr. Rowland. He's an actual, uh, an actual client, or he was a few years ago. He's moved into, uh, into complex care now. So uh, I live in the Comox Valley. It's, uh, it's fairly rural uh, in Comox itself. It's a population uh, about 12,000. And um, uh, Mr. Rowland, was, uh, he was a widower. He was 86 years old at the time that we were providing support to him. And he had uh, a daughter in the back who had a very young child, as you can tell. And uh, she had a husband who worked uh, regularly. Uh, she had another older uh, child as well. 
And um, Mr. Roland was living uh, slightly rural, could still access, uh, you know, bus routes, uh, but um, it was a little bit, a little bit far removed from from the actual the town of Comox. And uh, he had had a stroke. Uh, was very, very mobile, very, still very functional. Um, required uh, home support, so was receiving uh, three visits a day. Uh, you had your basic uh, assistance with, you know, housekeeping, meals. Uh, medication reminders. Um, but one of the areas where it was big concern was he was a risk of falls, and uh, he was a logger in his previous days, and he loved to go out into the trails, uh, and uh, had, had shown some uh, poor judgment with regards to his ability to dress properly, um, the appropriate timing to get out into those trails. And so one of the particular situations that happened was uh, Mr. Roland uh, got up, one early spring morning, it was about five o'clock in the morning, and he thought it would be a fantastic uh, day to go out for a hike, which he was, he was right, it was a fantastic day. Uh, he was dressed in um, only a pair of shorts and t-shirt, it was about three degrees outside. Uh, he went out uh, to seek the trails. Uh, thankfully, a neighbor uh, who happened to be up walking their dog noted um, that Mr. Roland likely shouldn't have been outside walking towards the trails and was able to alert the family. And so I was thinking to myself, well, Mr. Roland would have been um, likely a really good candidate for some of these surveillance and monitoring in the home. Um, he likely could have benefited from it. His, uh, his daughter uh, you know, lived about 10 miles away, but was really, really busy with her own family. She still came in every day, um, but there was still probably about mm, 18 hours of the day that, that Mr. Roland was on his own. Uh, he was receiving about maybe six hours of, of actual support during the day. So in terms of who can benefit, uh, I had an interesting conversation. Um, I called a couple of my clients because I was curious about their, their take on things, and I, I called a couple of family caregivers. And uh, one of my family caregivers said, uh, well, it shouldn't be called surveillance and monitoring. It should just be called peace of mind from a, care from a family caregiver's perspective. And I thought, you're, you're absolutely right. And then I talked to, uh, to one of my 95-year-old clients who lives independently uh, in her own home, and she receives about two hours of, uh, of private care per day. And she said, well, surveillance and monitor, that to me would equate loss of independence and loss of control. And I thought, you're right, too. So you can see how there's sort of this, uh, these meetings of somewhere, how do, we, how do we meet in the middle here? But so who can benefit? Well, clearly family caregivers can benefit. Uh, if you live afar or if you're working uh, full time and you have young children or you just lead a really, really busy life, it can provide some peace of mind. If you're providing heavy care and you require respite, I, mean, I think about, uh, you know, you look, at, um, you look at the statistics around who's providing care and we know, we know that spousal caregiving is huge. And so we often have 94 year olds, 95 year olds living in their own home and if it were not for that spouse, that spousal caregiving, they would be hooped. We know that. Uh, but those aging caregivers have their own health, you know, health concerns. And so if they're providing heavy care, whether it's grooming, personal care, but even ongoing queuing, uh, it's a very physically and emotionally tiring uh, position for that individual. So you could see how, how some of these particular surveillance and monitoring could actually assist and provide some uh, respite for those spousal caregivers who are, who are really close to being burnt out. And then, of course, the sandwich generationers who have their own families to care for, uh, who are often working full-time, um, and, and geographically we do see there's a lot more long-distance caregivers. So in terms of the actual uh, individuals who would have the devices or the sensories inside their home, uh, you, we talk, yesterday we talked about how do, you, how do you package it so that the individuals agreeing to it understand the benefits. And so it's you know, looking at the risk of falls, the risk of uh, well, wandering, you likely wouldn't, uh, that's a benefit again to the family caregivers, but trying to find that benefit for the, the actual client itself. Um, the confusion and forgetfulness, that was a mouthful, uh, with activities of daily living and, and those individuals with complex health care needs. Um, from a family caregiving perspective, I would say that uh, it has the most benefit. Um, and, you know, one of the questions I asked uh, some of the, the companies was, well, who do, you, who do you deal with directly? Who pays for your services? 
and uh, you know, what are some of the challenges when you go into someone's home to set it up and they, they don't want the service or they don't want the surveillance? How, you know, how do you end up dealing with that piece? Um, and I think that's a really important question for us to, um, to explore further. So uh, just quickly, we'll talk a bit about uh, the pros and cons. So uh, one, of the, you know, one of the interesting things is, is really how affordable some of these surveillance and monitoring uh, techniques are compared to, say, private home care. Um, you looked at the range of, uh, of pricing, and uh, you know, you're looking at anywhere sort of between $100 to $250 per month. I mean, that's the equivalent to less than 10 hours of private home care. So in terms of uh, affordability, for some individuals where those needs are really, really high, you could certainly see how that would be, um, could, could certainly be a benefit. They're typically very easy to install and, and use when I spoke to the individuals. Um, they're typically very, they can be very passive, and so the individuals where it's inside their home, they're, they're not required to do uh, anything to prompt it or to interact with it. Um, although in yesterday's uh, presentation with um, with Claris, I, I was uh, intrigued by um, you know that that the interface piece and the interaction piece, and really it provides peace of mind uh, for family caregivers and for for those seniors who understand the technology and how it's going to assist them. Uh, it also provides them with peace of mind knowing that uh, their caregivers, their family, their adult children, are, are and spouse. Uh, spousal caregivers um, feel a reduced uh, sense of anxiety and burden. So some of the cons, in most cases, they still actually rely on a caregiver or a health professional to react to the alerts. So there still needs to be that, that secondary piece where the caregiver might get the alert by text and they still need to respond. There's typically no direct human contact. Uh, and, and typically we're looking at these physical responses rather than emotional. Although last night with Ed, you know, the, the robot, uh, you know, he was pretty darn close to direct human contact. Uh, I, I marveled at uh, some of the individuals that actually you know, were, were interacting with, with Ed. Uh, I could have a lot of use for Ed in my own home uh, sometimes. Uh, when I go to that 8 p.m. Uh, cupboard with the chips, right, I could have Ed tell me, do not open that cupboard, Wendy. Uh, and typically, um, the, the seniors that I spoke to, I, only, I, I spoke to about five uh, clients, um, any devices they typically have in their home right now, they find them very complicated to use. Uh, and also, they feel as though it's a real intrusion in their own, their own privacy and this sort of fear of big brother. Um, I was pleasantly surprised with some of the technology, the music box, and uh, some of the more simpler um, interfaces, I thought, uh, were certainly moving forward to, uh, to making it a lot easier to use. So what I just wanted to, to touch on is that uh, you know, there's different levels of monitoring. Obviously, there's the no-tech. So um, I don't know any, many of you that, that have neighbors or elderly, senior, uh, elderly uh, residents, but um, the no-tech is the opening and closing of the curtains. So you know in the morning, your, your neighbor across the road, they open their curtains to let you know they're okay, and they close them at night to let they're okay. Um, that in itself is a, a very no-tech uh, monitoring, check-ins from friendly neighbors. And then our low tech typically might be a bit more of a, a personal emergency response system, medication dispensing, uh, and so. And then the high tech is, you know, looking at those video cameras, the sensory detectors, and the interface with uh, with the users. So I think there's a there's a real uh, a scope that people can can tap into. So finally, I just did a very quick cursory um, a search, and uh, what well, you know, what's on the market. Um, these were some of the uh, some of the companies that I found. I did have a chance to um, to actually call and and to speak with um, individuals about their product and how they work and the price range. Um, it sounds like I have a minute left, so I don't have a lot of time to uh, to to divulge into that. But I, I think what I wanted to um, finish up with is that I think f from a consumer perspective, it's it's really really important that whether you're a family caregiver uh, or um, an aging individual yourself, that, that knowing the right questions to ask about a product, um, knowing what your needs are. So knowing, understanding where you might benefit from these particular technologies is really, really helpful. Um, asking about how the information is being stored, how it's being used, who can access it. Um, with uh, the CareLink Advantage, for example, um, they have uh, an interface that all the caregivers can access. 
and it, it shows you, uh, you know, if you've, if you've opened the door at what time, um, alerts might go by if it doesn't fit the pattern. Uh, but the question is, well, taking a look at, well, who's, who's going to use that information? What's it being used for? Can anyone access it besides the users themselves? What's the safety around that? Um, how comfortable are, are uh, care staff knowing that they're on, you know, a video camera? Uh, even though it's not directly related to their position, especially if you're using, say, the public health care system. How does that interface with those two? Um, you know, those were some of the questions that I had as I was calling those individuals. So as, as consumers or individuals going forth, I think it's really important to, to consider that piece. And uh, I'm hoping that uh, we might be able to explore that a little bit further. So thank you very much for your time. Okay, I'm going to try to do two mini topics here. Um, one is about the law, uh, going into a, a little more detail, or just pulling apart so we can feel a little comfortable with two of the most um, uh, critical pieces of legislation that were referenced. Um, the laws governing collection, use, and disclosure of personal information. And the second thing I'd like to do is talk a little bit about how little is known about the effects and efficacy of surveillance technologies in this context. So first, I'm going to do a little bit of a legal waiver. I tell this joke about myself when I talk to um, patients' rights audiences, because I come from patients' rights. That's what I used to do before I was in law school. And when I was a patients' rights advocate, I tell you, I knew the law. I would always say, you can't do that. It's against the law. That's discrimination. I knew everything about the law. And then I went to law school, and now all I can say in answer to any question is, hmm, it depends. Right? <laughs> You know, it's kind of a drag this way, but I, I want to explain a little bit about why, particularly in this context, it depends. So I want to unpack a little bit about how they go about developing what are essentially the legal test. It's not a hard line that says over here and over here go in this direction. It's a test, and so you have to apply the facts and the context to the legal principles, and then you come out with the answer. That's why so often it depends. So firstly, just about any surveillance of people that you can think of, whether you're uh, monitoring their location, whether you're monitoring blood pressure, whether you're capturing visual images through a camera, that is data about an identifiable individual, and it is personal information for the purposes of statutory privacy law. So just about anything you can think of relating to an identifiable individual. And so for the purposes of this discussion, we're going to say that there's three classes that are relevant. One is private citizens. Then there are service providers in the public sector, service providers in the pri private sector. Now, service providers in the private sector, so that's not government facilities, private sector, are governed by, I'm going to say PIPA. We've discussed, we've already heard this before. It's the Personal Information Protection Act. Now, here's a thumbnail sketch of what the private sector's privacy obligations are under this act. The private sector can collect, use, and disclose personal information for purposes that a reasonable person would consider appropriate in the circumstances. Okay, you can see why it depends, right? Okay, the reasonableness standard maps all over privacy law. Now, with few exceptions, the key concepts in the private sector are consent. The act requires consent for the collection of personal information, although the consent can be implied where it would be obvious to a reasonable person what the information is for and the individual is voluntarily providing the information for that purpose. So whether the consent is express or implied in the private sector, the ability to collect personal information is limited to those purposes, again, which a reasonable person would consider appropriate in the circumstances and that fulfill the purposes that the organization says it needs it for or that are otherwise authorized in the act. So what that protection essentially includes is the idea of, you know, if, if I just on a sideline want to ask you what your IQ is because I'm interested, even if you consent, it has no relevance to what it is that I'm providing a service for. I'm not supposed to be asking that question, right? So it's got to be reasonable. Consent, um, express or implied, that's kind of the private sector kind of go-to. Now, undoubtedly, there are some entirely uncontentious uh, usage, usages of surveillance technologies in this discussion, especially if a solid safety and security case is made. But it likely, in the private sector, still uh, requires consent. Um, 
But in the more privacy invasive technologies, the more speculative the safety and security case, the more likely you are to run afoul of the reasonableness standard. So further, it's not only, as we've been discussing in scenarios and how complex this is, um, residents, personal information that's gonna be collected with some surveillance technologies. Cameras in particular are gonna collect personal information of staff. What PIPA says about the collection of personal information of employees is that you can collect that personal information if it is, maybe we could get a chorus going here, reasonable for the purposes of establishing and managing or terminating an employment relationship with them and you give them notice. So the only time under this act that you are allowed to collect employee information covertly, secretly filming them, for example, without notice, is if it is reasonable to expect that providing notice would compromise the ability or accuracy of the personal information, and that particular collection is in relation to a reasonable investigation or proceeding, has to be a specific investigation or proceeding. So not simply covert monitoring of staff being allowable because, oh, maybe something bad is gonna happen here. Not under PIPA, okay? meaning the private sector. So but if the staff know ahead of time they're being filmed. Then you, you, you require notice. Yes. You require notice. Okay? And again, even then, it has to be reasonable. So blanket surveillance may simply not be unreasonable. So let me give you an example. Um, there were two cases that the Privacy Commissioner just ruled on about GPS monitoring. Right? GPS monitoring essentially of two uh, banks of employees, one in a elevator operator um, repair company. And part of the argument was, look, it is absolutely reasonable to say we need GPS monitoring because you're, if you're stuck in that elevator shaft, we need to know. That's a good argument. But if you ask to hang on to this sensor 24-7, uh-uh, right? Not reasonable, right? So during your work hours, not your lunch, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's that finely gradated in terms of what constitutes reasonable employee surveillance-wise. Okay? So over into the public sector, in the main, the privacy protections are not as good in the public sector as in the private sector. Consent is less central in the public sector. The public sector does not need consent if the personal information it is collecting relates directly to and is necessary for the program or activity of the public body in question. So that's hospital under the hospital act? That's correct. So the public sector also doesn't need consent if the collection of personal information is authorized under an act. So a specific act says you need this information. So that's, again, another subsection. Um, and if the information that is sought is not directly related to a program um, and isn't in a statute, the public body still has an opportunity to collect the information if in this case it gets consent. So there's three, three opportunities. Relates directly and is necessary, authorized under an act, or you get specific consent, right? So even though the public body doesn't have the same requirements for consent in, as the private sector, it nevertheless also must provide notice. That is, it must ensure that individuals who it is collecting personal information from are told the purpose for its collection, if that's not obvious, the legal authority for collecting it, and who to contact if they have any questions. So the public sector, similarly to the private sector, has to give notice to its employees of collection of personal information and can only forego no notice in pretty much exactly the same scenario as the private sector. Specific investigation and the notice would undermine the ability to investigate that specific uh, inquiry. The public sector, unlike the private sector, has um, enhanced security, information security requirements. Personal information must be stored in Canada. That means if you're using a cloud server, the cloud must be in Canada in the public sector. Um, not dissimilarly to the private sector, a case can be made for the use of surveillance technologies, but again, it requires a case. So in the public sector, if the facility is planning to proceed without consent, then it will have to argue that the collection of the information relates directly to and is necessary for the program. And the greater the vulnerability of the population of um, people that they are serving, the higher the safety needs of those service users, the greater the case for necessity. But again, the 
lower needs of the demographic in combination with a highly invasive technology, much like, less likely to meet the test of necessity. So finally, private citizens' homes. In the main, there are no laws relating to the uh, collection of personal information in private residence. Uh, there are still some legal matters that could, could arise. Um, for example, civil law, criminal law, we discussed that, voyeurism, criminal voyeurism, et cetera, et cetera. But in the main, if you're monitoring your own home, you are free to do so. Um, if you are receiving care in your home and you have a camera in your home that captures the personal information of a service provider who is attending you in your home, um, essentially nothing stops you from doing that except possibly a clause in your contract with the service provider. There's no statutory um, prohibition on that. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, uh, while you have a right to monitor yourself in your own private residence, you probably have no right to monitor uh, your family member or yourself in a facility residence. Um, so now I can't think of a legal reason why you couldn't have that surveillance technology in your family member's um, room or your own room in the facility if the facility and staff agreed to that. Right? Um, but unlike some US jurisdictions that we were hearing about, you have no legal right to place a camera in a family member's care facility. Um, so essentially, the facility could remove the camera if they knew it was there, although sometimes they don't if you bury it in a teddy bear. That's the, uh, that's the lesson from that. So the easiest way to look up the privacy legislation that I've been referring to, PIPA and FOIPA, the way that I suggest is to go to the um, the website of the BC Information and Privacy Commissioner. Um, the button that says about the OIPC has a drop down that will give you the legislation. They also have go to guides for things like video surveillance, et cetera, et cetera. So that's um, www.oipc.bc.ca. Or you can just plug into your search en engine, BC Privacy mm -hmm. Commissioner. Their website has got um, information on that. So five minutes, that's perfect. Um, I want to say a quick word about the potential for the unintended consequences of surveillance. Um, whenever somebody wants to use surveillance or monitoring technology, they're trying to achieve a benefit. Um, in this case, most usually safety and security. But the lived reality is that introducing new tools often has unintended consequences. So these are often not simple policy equations. Um, monitoring is often seen as um, viable and a much needed alternative to a, a, a series of um, issues and concerns, including the chemical, chemical and physical restraints of residents in high level care with lots of dementia and Alzheimer's patients. And this is, of course, massively important and needs to be encouraged. We need alternatives for these. On the other hand, we also cannot ignore that many surveillance technologies in this sphere are sold to providers as cost savers and are in fact meant to displace as opposed to um, optimize needed personal care. Um, no one has an unlimited budget. So if facility X has a certain amount of money to, to en spend on enhancing patient care, resident safety, should they spend that money on technology for monitoring or another staff member for that analog monitoring? Should they? Now, wouldn't this be a great thing to know? I want to know. Um, so last year, I tried to see what kind of research had been done into the efficacy of the new surveillance technologies in seniors' care. So we had some means of comparator. What should we do? And I found that hardly any exists. So in answer to the question, of what would best promote the ends of safety and security, the answer is at this juncture, we just don't know. Um, what we can say is that alongside much of the hope for the new technologies, there is an increasing concern that new models are inadvertently selling abandonment as autonomy, and that some of the technological imperative is intending to displace, as I said, personal care. And so what I am urging is not only a research agenda here, um, but that we analyze this in the broader ecosystem of care. Um, it is possible that changes in the overall ecosystem of care can and will make residents less safe than homey old-fashioned personal care. And we need to remember that tools shape practice 
as Ursula Franklin so critically reminds us, we love to believe that practice shapes tools, but the science doesn't support that. Tools shape practice. So what I want to urge against, and the cautionary tale that I'm going to commend to you, um, is one that you would find, again, if you want to plug into your search engine, a report called Fortress Britain. And Fortress Britain is about securitization of space. And the notion here about what has inadvertently happened when embedded in best practice and, importantly, insurance guidelines are a series of technological solutions that actually undermined people's sense of personal safety and security. So I'm not suggesting that there is an agenda here to do such a thing, but that these policy considerations are vexed. We don't have the needed research um, in order to make truly informed decisions, and that we need to move cautiously, especially before, as we go on necessary experimentations. We don't inbuild standards that turned out to be quite perverse in terms of the outcomes we had intended. Thank you very much. Question, yes? Thank you very much. Les Rowe, I'm a retired teacher. There are several things that were spoken about this morning that speak to the need and the requirement for balance. Balance between dignity and the respect for all concerned, both the client and the provider of service, and some kind of ombudsperson or group and the whole question of whistleblower protection when things turn out not to be quite what they should be, very much like the last thing that was mentioned regarding Fortress Britain, for example. Thank you. Hi. I feel like I've been up here a couple of times. This is a very passionate uh, topic of, of uh, technology and aging in place. Uh, my name is David Rittenhouse. I'm president of Integrated Tracking Technologies, and I'm also a volunteer uh, co-founder of a public safety program uh, in Victoria called Project Lifesaver of Greater Victoria. And uh, yeah, I feel like um, I'm looking at things from the uh, private sector as uh, we design and manufacture wireless tracking technology, wearable tracking technology for uh, uh, for people with uh, cognitive impairments. So I, I feel like I'm, I'm amongst my tribe here. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm interested in the topic, uh, many topics, uh, both from uh, health care uh, delivery for, you know, to help um, family caregivers caring for someone at home, and as well for professional caregivers who are caring for people throughout the continuum of care and the, the issue of uh, elopement. Um, I'm interested, actually, a, a question regarding the study of, uh, of GPS trackers, and you know, there was mention about uh, how trackers have been used. Um, were, are there any it, uh, are there any more examples of how or how effective the uh, the GPS trackers were in helping in the in the care facility environment? Um. <clears throat> The, you know, there, there, there's, there, there, there are some sort of positive results from using GPS trackers, especially in the event of, of, of elopement. Uh, the, 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 the key thing is that, uh, you know, from, from a very practical perspective, uh, you know, when you have um, the, the trackers and placing the trackers with the residents, either with, 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 when you keep it in the pocket or uh, on, their, on their person, you know, when it comes back, the, 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 you know, the staff will throw that in the laundry you know, it gets washed and gets damaged and, and destroyed, and it's very hard to replace. Um, uh, alternatively, you know, the, the resident may, may, may find it or whatever, or, or, or you, know, you can't quite wear it on the wrist. Forget that, forget the ankle, they'll, they, they'll cut it off. It's very irritating. Uh, you know, you sort of try to hide in the shoes, uh, or, you, or you, 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 you sort of pin it to them. Um, but, you know, it's, 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 it's just, it's just a, that's, that's the, the primary sort of issue around GPS trackers. Now, you know, if you are able to secure your facility, um, and you know you do have, uh, it's 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 keep at it. The neighborhood is safe space. 
uh, for the residents. They can wander as they wish, and uh, you know, it reduces agitation. Um, you know, it reduces um, uh, their irritation. Um, they have access to wandering uh, loops in in the courtyard, um, and is designed in a, in a manner that is like, um, uh, accessible uh, to them. Um, then that that is the alternative that, that most uh, residential care facilities have. Uh, gone after we, we are we're starting in a position where we do have that alternative now for um, elderly residents at home living at home GPS trackers may be a more uh, viable alternative uh, and that's 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 yours if you, if you have any comments on that uh, just a, a question about uh, for the, the Residential uh, Care Act and you know it, it talks about privacy and the, the rights of, uh, of a resident uh, for within uh, the facility. Um, are there, is there, you know, the, the issue, and uh, many people touched on this, it's a balancing act between the resident's um, or a client's right to freedom and, and liberty, uh, but then as well there's the caregiver responsibilities balance to keep them safe, um, you know, especially with someone with a, a cognitive impairment, you know, uh, someone who has diminished um, mental reasoning who might walk out into traffic walk into the ocean, you know, if, if they do elope. Um, one of the things we've seen with uh, Project Lifesaver is that many care facility operators in Greater Victoria view Project Lifesaver that uses radio tracking technology as their second line of defense to elopement. So you're right, uh, facilities do need to have the elopement prevention strategies in place and the, you know, the security systems, but you know, with the new emerging technologies, and Project Lifesaver has been around for 15 years in North America, and with the emerging tracking, uh, wearable tracking technologies, I think there's an opportunity to look beyond the front door uh, in terms of offering residents uh, a safe way for them to be located by caregivers, both um, professional caregivers and family caregivers, and how um, these technologies can quickly locate people and bring them back to safety. And then as well, also um, uh, giving family caregivers, you know, the, like you said, the sandwich generation, the ones who are using their smartphone for everything, they want to be empowered to have peace of mind to quickly and effectively locate their family member if they, uh, if they wander away. Thank you. We've gone, we've gone over you. time here a bit, so I don't know if people will let us have one more question or do you want to go have a break or one more? Okay. I get the last word. Yes. I'm Lily Liu, I'm from the University of Alberta. And in fact, David and I are gonna have lunch soon to talk about potential collaboration. Uh, at the University of Alberta, we are just completing, um, and by the way, I'm a member of the AgeWell Network as well. So we are just completing an, um, a study that uh, is, uh, has been completed in collaboration with um, our Alberta Health uh, Services, Health Authority. So it's a provincial-wide uh, study and also in collaboration with industry. In this particular case, it's with Safe Tracks. Um, in fact, the vendor is just about to show up and we'll be having lunch as well and discussing going forward what we're gonna do. Uh, so the study um, is funded by AHS, so, um, which is interesting because it's a consumer product. Uh, we have three, um, products that we are testing, that we have tested with 47 dyads of caregiver, so care uh, partner with uh, individuals with, with dementia. This is through home care. Um, we, the three devices are um, a device, small device that's like a cell phone that's worn around the neck on a lanyard, or they can clip to a belt. Um, the other is um, a, a wrist a watch type device that is lockable. And then the final, which has become quite um, interesting, is a uh, GPS-enabled insole that is worn in the, the right insole of the shoe, and it's become quite, um, quite popular. So uh, we actually have data, and I, I really enjoyed your panel because what it's, um, I think, reassured me is that we've been doing, we've been addressing the right questions, looking at the ecological issues surrounding the use. Our whole intention at the beginning is um, to use GPS in the community to try and help the caregivers or the care partners. And what's uh, interesting is over the course of, so on average they've used it for about five months in this one, one year study. And what's interesting is that um, some of them have had to go into facility care or want, were on a wait list and of course want to take advantage of this. 
the families wanted to keep the GPS devices, and we found that they were actually useful in the facility as well. It allowed them to start to participate in activities outside of um, a locked unit. And uh, the facility, some of them even wanted to get involved in the monitoring as well. So um, the data is coming out. We looked at, we have objective quantitative data as well as focus, focus group type data. That is, I think, gonna be very interesting. And then my last point to make, which I think will be of, of interest to this audience, is that Alberta Health Services actually has a branch now that is seriously contemplating funding um, these uh, consumer products, although it was designed to be used with caregivers in the community. So that's really exciting. I, I know the, the focus of our panel was, uh, was widespread, but um, the, I'm sorry, I forgot your name, but uh, Dave, thanks. Um, it, it brought up a really good point about with regards to the family care caregiving piece, and, and although it's really important from uh, the individuals who's actually using the product, the, the senior themselves, and understanding that, that risk and, and the ethical piece, from a family caregiving piece, when you look at the fact that 80% of all care is done by informal caregiving, um, I think that you know, how, how products are designed uh, to support that piece is really important, but it shouldn't replace it should be a complementary, and I think that's you know one of the one of the important messages too is that uh, it's a real spectrum, isn't it, of of products both no tech, that's that nice personal hands on, you don't want to lose that, but then there are some really important components where having that high tech would be really really helpful uh, with regards to collecting that information and, and using it in the in the right way. So thank you.